Friends, I do want to encourage you, whether you're watching online or you're with us this morning in person, to jump into these 21 days of hope. Um, I know if you're like me, you're a little hesitant, you're like, man, the last thing I need is more text messages and more emails. Come on, somebody. But at the same time, there is something powerful about daily reminders, daily reminders of how we live as disciples of Christ, daily reminders of hope coming to you just to receive from Jesus so that you cannot just be one who receives hope, but as Christians, you can be a hope dealer. That's what you're called to be. That's what God has designed you to be. And these are gonna be simple ways for you to, to recenter your mind on these 21 days heading up towards Easter and just say, Lord, I wanna receive hope from you and I wanna give that away. So I encourage you, jump in. You can, if you miss that number, you can get more info about it in the lobby. But it's a journey that we're all taking together. And as we head towards Easter, we, wanna, we want to provide the hope of Jesus to as many people as possible. Amen? Okay, uh, who's excited about diving back into the Gospel of John? Because I'm fired up about it today. And, you know, the 9 a.m., it is daylight savings, or we, we're springing forward, everyone lost an hour. I, you know, there was zero excitement in the 9 a.m., so I just, I just need a little energy from you guys today just to make up for the, the deficit. Look, my identity is not in your claps and your applause but it is just a little bit, okay? I just, <laughs> only kidding. Um, man, today as we dive into John 15, if you have a Bible, you can, you can turn there. And we've been looking the last several weeks at what is known by theologians and those throughout church history as the farewell discourses. The farewell discourses, the last things that Jesus says to his followers before he goes to the cross to die for them. Before he goes to, to battle sin and Satan, death in the grave, and then to rise again from the grave, which we're going to celebrate together on Easter, and before he goes away and ascends back into heaven, he wants to leave um, just some of his most important and precious teachings to his disciples and to his followers, and that's what we're looking at in John 13, all the way up to John 18 and 19, where he is crucified for the sins of the world. And in John 15, friends, something I love about this passage so much is Jesus gives us a metaphor. He gives us an analogy. And if you've ever wanted to just hear from God, if you've ever wanted to know, man, what would God just speak to me and say to me? I just want to encourage you today. We're going we're gonna to read from the actual words of God, from Jesus himself to you. And as I teach through this passage of scripture, God is gonna speak to your hearts. He's gonna speak to you in different ways because the word of God is living and active and it's gonna be applied to your life in different ways. And so my encouragement to you is lean in and listen close to what the spirit of God might be saying to you today because he's been wrecking me in this chapter all week and it's good, and so I just wanna share it with you because, man, the words of God, they bring life, they bring hope, they bring joy, they bring strength, they bring sanctification, and that's why, man, here at Hills Church, we preach from God's word. And so, John 15, what we're looking at today, you're gonna see this in the verses, is this idea of pruning, <laughs> And I tell you what, since moving to California from the East Coast, I have never learned more about grapevines and vineyards and pruning and how this whole thing works. And it's unbelievable. And this entire chapter is about that because, you know, Jesus lived in an agriculture, an agrarian culture back 2,000 years ago. And they knew about vines and grapes and vineyards. And he wants to teach the truth of God and his kingdom in word pictures through metaphors that we can all understand. And so we're going to learn today the purpose of pruning when it comes to our own lives and what that means, uh, the pain of pruning and why, why we have to go through things like this in our lives, but the promise, the hope of pruning in the end is what we're going to land on. And so we're going to start right here, John 15, starting in verse 4. Before we get to pruning, there's a really important word, and depending on what translation, this is a New Living Translation, it's either going to say remain or it's going to say abide. And here's what Jesus says. He says, remain in me. 
In other words, that's on you. That's on me. He says, abide in me, remain in me, stay with me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed, if it is cut off from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine. Jesus says, I'm the vine. You are the branches. That's our role. We are branches connected to the vine. And our number one task is to stay attached to the vine. That's the only way we live. He says, those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Nothing. That's an amazing indictment. That's a powerful promise. If we stay in Christ, in Christ all things are possible. Apart from him, nothing is possible that is of eternal worth or value in your life or mine. Friends, it reminds me, when we lived in Atlanta, this is actually a photo of our house in Atlanta. We lived in the city of Atlanta, loved this old house. We, we redid parts of it when we moved in. One of the things I'm most proud about is these front steps because they used to be wood and I decided to become a bricklayer and I went and bought bricks from this old salvage yard and trust me, this little part right here was really tough. Um, but I'm proud of that. Now, as a dad, one of the things that you love when your kids are young and little uh, is when you get home, it is like Christmas morning every day. They are so excited to see you. The older they, you know, they get, the less excited they are to see you. In fact, it's more like, Dad, stay in the car. Don't show your face to anyone. If you do, like, I'm going to murder you later when I get home. But when they're little, they still just want to be around you all the time. And so I remember coming home, and we had a screen door on our, our front porch. And I mean, Lily Hope would come busting through that screen door the moment I pulled my, my car into the driveway. And Sawyer could barely walk. And when a, to a toddler can barely walk, they're just, they're a constant danger to themselves, constant. And so he would hear my car and he'd see his sister running. And so he'd be waddling and, you know, he'd sort of push the screen door open. And I just remember it was always sort of a race against the clock for me to get parked and out of my car before he got to the edge of the front steps. Especially if Lindsay was like inside doing something or occupied with something and she lost sight of him for a second. Like he was always about to fall down those steps. Any steps in the house were just danger. That's why you have those like gates, you know, for toddlers so they don't tumble down the stairs. We should have put one on her front porch. And I just remember so often, I'd pull my car up in the driveway and I'm like, all right, park. And here comes Lily Hope. She's running out and Sawyer comes and he's walking in the steps. And there were moments when I'm like hanging on to Lily Hope. I'm like, Sawyer, stay, remain, <laughs> do not move. You know, and he's like, eh, dad, bow, you know, down the front steps he goes. And it, it was a race for me to catch him there. But I, I think about what Jesus is saying to us and it reminds me of that because so often, so often in life as humans, we, we tend to get our value based on what we do, how fast we run, how much we accomplish. As we think about our lives as humans, you know, what we have to understand is that Jesus says we're the branch and being the branch means finding our significance in who I am, not what I do. Not what I do. It's more about listening to the Father say, remain, stay, abide in my love. You don't have to come to me, I'm coming to you. You don't have to always run after me, I've already run after you first before anything else, receive my love and then live your life from that place. Another way to put it is like this, it means that success and significance in your life is not just based on what you do but on who you are connected to, who you are becoming. Success and significance in your life is not just based on what you do. And friends, work matters, accomplishment matters. But when accomplishment and performance and doing overrides who you are as a son or daughter of God, and it replaces the reality of remaining and being and just receiving the fact that you are loved beyond belief by Jesus through the cross, 
When those two get switched, you face burnout, you get exhausted, you end up worshiping your production and your accomplishment, and it ends up, if you don't accomplish or produce what you think you should have at this point in your life or whatever it may be, then suddenly your entire worth and significance is diminished because we are so focused on doing rather than being. And friends, when Jesus called his first disciples, he did not say to them, okay, guys and gals, here we go. Here's how you're gonna do these greater things that I talked about. Here's how you're gonna become who I've made you to be. I've actually gone to the liberty of creating a five-year strategic plan for each of you. It's based on your Myers-Briggs disc profile strength finder, and it's cross-correlated with your Enneagram and your wing, okay? So if you just follow this strategic plan to a T, then you're gonna find your life's purpose and you're gonna live into everything I created you to be. No. No. He didn't do that or say that. He goes, abide, remain, stay connected to me. And believe me, if you stay connected, if you stay in my word, if you live a life of prayer and you're focused on first receiving the love of the gospel and then doing from that place not to earn significant or find your worth, friends, you will be fruitful beyond imagining. Your life will be the overflow of joy, not the product of stress. Your life will be the overflow of joy and love, not the product of a rat race towards self-significance. That's why abiding in Christ and staying connected to the vine is of utmost importance. It's of utmost importance. So here's the question. What is the purpose of pruning what is the purpose of pruning? If we're gonna run with this metaphor of the vine and Jesus talks about this reality of branches that are pruned and cut, what's the point? What's the purpose? Here's what it says in God's word. He says, I am the true grapevine. I'm the true vine. My father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. So there's two different analogies he's using here. Two different senses of this word. There's a personal pruning that must happen. Friends, there are things in your life and mine that God wants to cut away. He wants to cut those things away. And there's a reason that he wants to cut those things away. There are things in your life and mine that are no longer serving us or helpful to us and God is going to remove them from our lives and yes, it will hurt. It will be painful. That's part of the pruning process. But friends, there is a slim difference and I, I learned this as I went on this deep dive into how vineyards work this week, fascinating stuff. But there is a slim difference between cutting off and pruning just a slim margin of difference. Because when, when the vine dresser, when the gardener prunes back the branches, he just leaves a little bit left. But when he cuts off a branch or a shoot, he literally leaves nothing left. He leaves no, leaves no of the, the little buds remaining that will grow into the new shoots of the grapevine. And so N.T. Wright, as I was studying this, he said it like this. He's one of my favorite theologians. He said, the gardener will cut out, particularly the parts of the plant that are growing inwards and getting tangled up. He will encourage the shoots that are growing outwards towards the light. He prunes the vine, in other words, to help it become its true self. Isn't that amazing? to help it become who it's always meant to be. I, I learned that if, if a grapevine is not given a trellis to grow on, if it's not pruned or cut, that it will have so many vines that branch off from the main stem that it will literally become a tangled mess. It will eventually get infected with fungus or rot. It won't produce grapes that are sweet. It will barely produce any grapes at all because there's too many vines that are cutting out the light from where the grapes would grow. 
It has no direction in its life, and it has all of these different branches that are sucking life away from the, the trunk and the actual fruit, uh, the fruit-bearing shoots where it should be producing grapes. It's wild. And so the purpose of a vine dresser, and in this analogy, Jesus is a vine, God is the gardener, we are the branches. Jesus is a vine, God is the gardener. He's the one that prunes the vine, and we are the branches. He comes along and he prunes the branches. And friends, a gardener, especially one uh, who, who tends to a vineyard, as I was researching this, it's almost like a work of art. Because they're, they're looking at the vine, and they're deciding, man, which which branch is, is strong? Which one is producing good shoots that produce good vines that are full of really healthy clusters of grape? Because those are the ones that we want to help produce more the following years. And I remember when, when we first moved out here, there was this reality in me where I thought, gosh, um, the vineyards were so beautiful. We moved out in fall and we saw all the vineyards changing colors and my wife and I would visit some different wineries and it was just beautiful. And then, you know, around this time of year, we went back and we were visiting again and it looked like utter devastation. I just thought to myself, what happened to these beautiful vineyards? Like maybe a storm came through and they decided to like destroy them all and cut them all and just... You know, it, it looked like they were devastated when in reality, you know, those who were the vine dressers went through and they pruned them back so that the next year they would grow even more. And they chose which branches to keep and which, which ones produced healthy shoots so that they could have good foliage that covered the grapes and provided shade for the heat in the summer. And I thought, man, this whole thing is an incredible, incredible detail and science behind all of it. But friends, the pruning of God in our lives, first and foremost, it's about your personal transformation. It's about you becoming who God intended you to be. And then as you surrender and trust the pruning of God, as God removes things from your lives, whether it's a relationship or a career path that you thought for sure that that's what you wanted, it could be anything, fill in the blank. Whatever God has removed from your life in the past, God is saying, look, that's, that's a branch, that's a shoot, that's something that is ultimately not going to help you. That's something I needed to remove because I'm looking at the full picture of your life and I wanna make sure that you grow strong, that you grow straight and true and that your branches and your life produces fruit that will be a blessing to generations to come. Now, when I say fruit, what do I mean? Galatians 5 really helps us fill in the blank with that. It talks about the fruit of the Spirit. Things like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Not things like worry, fear, anxiety, addiction, self-loathing, self-hatred, anger, impatience. All the different things that most of us are trying to get out of our lives, God is saying, hey, if you want these things to grow, then you have to submit to the pruning process. Also, you have to trust that when God redirects your life and you're following a branch happily one direction and God goes, nope, not that way. I need you to grow this way. You have to trust that he sees the best picture and he understands the full, the full length and scope of your life and what he plans to do in and through your life. I'll never forget how this played out in my life. Uh, I interned with this company at the University of Georgia and I ended up working for them afterwards. It was an insurance company. They had a whole bunch of different roles and I ended up um, <laughs> getting a job offer as an underwriter. An insurance underwriter, if you know anything about that and you know anything about me, you know that that immediately is a branch that needed to be cut out of my life. <laughs> I, you know, you put me in front of an Excel spreadsheet and ask me to like make sure all the details are correct for an entire day, 
It's a disaster for everyone. I'm tumbling face first down those steps and everyone's in a panic, okay? It's not good. I, I'm a words guy, I'm a creative guy, that I need to stay in my lane, right? And just a few months into this job, during the internship, you know, they had us trying all these different roles within the company. With a few months into it, my manager came to me and he goes, Hanson, uh, just, you know, a piece of advice for your entire future, okay? Don't ever do this job again. <laughs> going to say this to you in the kindest way possible. This is not your gifting or your gift mix. I'm like, I know, man, I'm dying here. He's like, okay, look, I'm not going to fire you, but let me just encourage you to go find something else quick. And I'm like, I'm on it. I hate this job. Let's go. Let's get out of here, right? And so I, I started to explore different things. I, I was starting to move towards sales. I'm like, I'm, I like, you know, uh, just people, I want to explain things, I want to talk about things, and you know, this feels like more of a fit for me, and there's a lot more things like golf involved in restaurants, and I'm like, okay, let's, let's do this, this is better. And this whole time, God's like working in my heart, and through this crazy series of events, I end up getting offered a, a full-ride scholarship to go to Asbury Seminary in Kentucky just through a random series of events. It was like this bizarre random open door. I had this little desire, not, not like, oh, I'm for sure called to go into ministry for the rest of my life. I, you know, I, I had an inkling that maybe God was calling me in that direction, but at that point, I'm 22, 21, 22, fresh out of college, trying to figure it out, and I'm pursuing these business opportunities, I'm pursuing these sales openings, and then the seminary opening comes along, and God goes, yeah, actually, I'm gonna snip all that stuff out, I want you to go this way. And we're gonna tie this branch right to the, the wire of the trellis, because I need this one to grow and remain strong. So my wife and I, Lindsay and I, we got married, we moved to Kentucky, we started a family, and I went to seminary. And then as seminary came to an end, I, I took a job in Atlanta as an associate pastor. I've shared parts of this story before, but I just, I want you to see a, a visual of this because I want you to understand it and apply it to your own life. I took, I, I finished my master's in divinity from Asbury Theological Seminary. I took an associate pastor role in Atlanta. We were moving back to be near family. We had young kids. The U-Haul truck was packed. I was fired up to start. And there was kind of this three-year plan for me to become the lead pastor of this church. And I'm not kidding you, on the way to Georgia, I get a phone call from the guy who was the current lead pastor, and he goes, Jonathan, we've had a major crisis. Uh, the church is splitting. There's all this crazy stuff happening. I thought, it, I thought we had passed all this, but it... It's not, it's just a disaster here right now. And I'm just thinking, why, you know, why did you not share any of this with me in the interview process? Like, what's going on? And we're sitting at a rest area in literally right across the border of Tennessee. And I'm hearing the news that I just left my job in Kentucky and I'm moving to Atlanta where we, the next day we're going to meet with a realtor to put a down payment on a house, but I don't have a job anymore. And I call my pastor in Kentucky back, and he's like, well, it'd be a little awkward. We just prayed you out, but we'll take you back if you want to come back. And I was like, I'm pretty sure God does not want me to live in Kentucky anymore. So <laughs> sorry to all those who live in Kentucky. A great place, just not for me. Um, and uh, well, Lindsay and I prayed about it. We remained in the vine. We stayed close to the vine, and we said, God, what is next? And we felt like he just said, go to Atlanta. I'm like, great, I'll be a barista at Starbucks with a master's in divinity. That's a branch and a shoot I didn't see coming, Lord. Like, what does this mean, right? And so I just start applying at every church I possibly can, and I end up getting a job offer at the church where I ended up working at, at Passion City Church, to be a kids director. I was like, oh, Lord, really? God bless Miss Kate and our kids team. They are, can we just give it up for Miss Kate and our kids team? She's a saint, and we're all going to be hanging out at her mansion in heaven, I promise you. But here's the deal. I remember going there, and the Lord was like, look, I'm going to teach you things. You're going to learn what it means to, to minister and to care for families. You're going to grow up. You're going to learn character. You're going to learn sort of the, you're just going to sort of cut your teeth on what it is to be in ministry, and don't worry about the title. Don't worry about what that is right now. Just be faithful with the little I give you. 
And just follow this branch as I prune it and trim it and it begins to flourish. And before long, I, I had gotten promoted to family pastor. And before long, I was invited on the preaching team. And before long, I'm pastor of community groups. And it's like, wow, I'm getting these cool opportunities at this amazing church. I need to learn from an amazing pastor. And I started as a kids director and God said, hey, I'm gonna prune some things, snip some things, and this is not gonna go the way you thought, but trust me, it's gonna be fruitful. And friends, there are gonna be things like that in your life where you're gonna look at that and say, Lord, what is going on? I, this is not the direction I thought it was going. And he's like, trust me, I had to cut that out. That's not you. That's not you and that's not who you are meant to be. The other side of this is the fruitfulness, the transformation that God wants to do in you. He wants to actually release it through you to the others around you. Because there are going to be people in your life that are cut off from the vine. They don't know the life and the joy of the vine. They've never met Jesus before. And he's actually gonna use you to be a part of grafting them back into life and joy and purpose. So they're not thrown away, so they don't waste their lives, but so they find the meaning of their lives. Moving on, this was a whole, I was gonna show you the analogy, but I just explained it to you. Um, the purpose of pruning, the pain of pruning. Friends, this process is painful. This process is so painful. There are moments of uncertainty, there are moments of loss, there's moments of grief, there's moments of confusion. There's moments as you're going through the pruning process where the vine is put under incredible stress. The branches are put under incredible stress. And the gardener, the vine dresser does that on purpose because when, uh, this was fascinating as I'm researching this, the vines that are put under the most stress and the branches under the most stress through the pruning process actually produce the sweetest fruit Pain is the pathway to transformation. Pain is the pathway to growth. Pain is the pathway to you becoming your true self. There's no other way. It's through the pruning process. And the pain of pruning, friends, it is painful, but it's worth it. And what Jesus would say to you is he'd say, remain, stay don't run from me. Trust me in the midst of this. I know it hurts. I know this is painful. I know it's fearful and you're uncertain of what the future may hold or you're wondering why this is happening, but just abide in me. Stay with me. Stay connected to the vine. Stay on your knees in prayer. Stay in my word. Stay connected to community, those who are also following me, because right there, if you get disconnected from those things, you're not going to make it. You're not gonna make it. The band can come out with this. This is the last one. The pain of pruning and then the promise of pruning. I wanna actually move past this. N.T. Wright said it like this. He said, the vine dresser is never closer to the vine, taking more thought over its long-term health and productivity than when he has the knife in his hand. The gardener is never closer to the vine, taking more thought over its long-term health and productivity than when he has the knife in his hand, like a careful surgeon who loves you and cares for you and wants the best for your life. That's your heavenly father. That's the care that he takes for your life. Um, as many of you know, a few weeks back, we had a huge storm that came through, a huge storm, and our, uh, our backyard has those redwoods in it, and the next day after the storm, man, there were branches all over my backyard. And something was interesting as I thought about this because most of the branches that were on the ground, they had no leaves, they had no needles on them, no pine needles on them. I realized they were already dead. They were hanging on to the tree by a thread. There were a ton of branches that were still on all of my trees with healthy growth and healthy vegetation, but the ones that were on the ground, they were barren, they were dry, they were brittle. 
They were connected to the vine, they were connected to the tree, but there was, there was something inside of them that was already dead. And when the storm came through, when the winds blew really hard, they got disconnected completely from the vine and they were laying on the ground because there was hidden sin in their life. There were things in their life that were eating them away from the inside out and it was weakening their connection to the vine. And friends, God wants you to walk in the light. He wants you to walk in wholeness and healing. He wants you to remain in him, to stay connected to him by staying connected to the body of Christ, staying connected in a small group, staying connected to friends and family and those who love you and care for you and want the best for you. But here's what I wanna say. Maybe some of you today are saying to yourself, yeah, I've been through some storms, pastor, I feel like that branch lying on the ground that's either been cut off or blown off by the wind. Is there any hope for me? Yes. One of the most amazing things I read as I was researching vineyards and grapevines and all the things was something called bleeding the vine. And if there's a very productive vine healthy vine with a strong root system and a strong base, they will actually cut that vine deeply and they will graft in another branch to it so that that branch can live and find its nutrients from the vine, but it's only through a deep cut within the vine. Friends, Jesus is the vine. When he went to the cross and his side was pierced and his hands were pierced and the thorns were on his head and his, his back was lashed with a whip and he was literally slaughtered for the sins of the world, friends, the vine was bleeding so that we as dead branches could be grafted back into the source of life, to the source of joy and the promise of pruning, the promise of this whole thing is, is this, Jesus said, I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, you will overflow with joy. You will be overflowing with life. Your life will not be something that is measured in striving or anxiety, but when you, as a dead branch, put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, who has bled and died for your sins, you get grafted back into joy, unending joy, life everlasting, hope that has no end. Friends, this is the gospel. This is the truth of God's grace for you and for me. And so as we head towards Easter, no matter what storm or devastation has come through your life, and as we're about to take communion together, I just want you to remember Jesus, the true vine, has bled and died that you and I could be grafted back into life. Maybe there's some of you watching online, maybe some of you in the room today, and I believe this to be true, who are putting your faith in Christ for the first time, who are saying, I've been dead. My branch has been disconnected. I have been blown off and blown asunder by the storms of this life, and your gracious Father in heaven is reminding you today through his words, his very words to you, that there is life and overflowing joy available through faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? Friends, let's take communion together as we close our service. If you have those cups, you can bring those out now. If you didn't get one, they're right outside the doors. You can, you're free to, to pop up right now and go grab a communion cup. But as you... Take a moment to just meditate and think about what this, this little wafer and this juice represents. It represents a bleeding vine. It represents God himself with such great love for you that he came down from heaven and died on a cross for your sins so that you and I could be grafted back into life. Friends, with that in mind, let's take communion now together.